Hey guys, hope you're doing well. I'm going to start goodness of fit um, hypothesis testing, and uh, it's going to be a little bit different um, because we're going to start dealing with some tables that get kind of big. I'm going to try to use not just a pen but also some text. Um, so, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll give it a shot and, and see how it goes. How about that? Um, okay, we're going to start off looking at multinomial populations. Uh, multinomial populations. And the kind of fit test we're doing is called a goodness of fit. So what we've done so far have been tests looking at uh, population parameters. Now we're going to be doing distributional tests. We're still looking kind of at population parameters, but we're looking at a bunch of them. Okay, now what we've done so far is we've looked at binomial. Binomial means two names or two classes, two categories. Uh, multinomial just means more than two categories. Um, binomial, these are proportions tests. When we did proportions, we were really looking at binomial uh, populations. Now we're looking at uh, greater than two. Multi is greater than two categories. Okay. Um, so, for example, well, what did, let's use an example that we're, that we're going to be working on today. Okay, so I'm going to make this stuff visible as I go along. So what we have now is we have a brand loyalty questionnaire. We're asking uh, customers what kind of tomato sauce they prefer. And what they tell us is one of these things. They prefer Progresso or Ragu or Prego, DiGiorno, Contadina or other. All right. And so we're going to ask a bunch of people. They're going to tell us this stuff. Um, and what we're going to do is then we're going to define the proportion of the population that chooses Progresso. Um, well, that's what we care about is what proportion chooses something. So let me uh, highlight that. There you can see that. The proportion of the population that chooses Progresso, whoops, a daisy, is going to be P1. The proportion of the population that likes Ragu is P2, and so on and so forth. We're going to ask everybody, and that's what we care about. We're trying to figure out what the proportions are, really. Now, let's say that for some reason we've done some previous research, and I'm totally making this up. So. Um, this is my data, it's not even data, it's just stuff I made up. Let's say that we think that uh, Progresso, Ragu, and Prego are both twice as popular as DiGiorno or Contadina, and about 20% of people prefer some other brand. Well, that means P6 is going to be 0.2, right? Pull out my pen so I can show you this. P6 is going to be 0.2. View. Why is it not letting me ink? There we go. 0 0.2. We're going to have 80% left. P1 and P2 and P3 are both twice as large as these. Um, and we worked that out. We got 80% left to split up. These are each going to be twice as big, which means if you, you work it out, you can figure out how you would work this out. These are also going to be 0 0.20. And these last two are going to be 0 0.10. It turns out that all the things I said are true. All right, they add up to one, which is important because it's 100% of the population. Um, and then we have those. And what we want to do is we want to test to see if this is true. These are the way hy way hy this is the way that hypotheses work for these usually. It's usually going to be under the null, it is true, and under the, we want to kind of want to determine if it's different from that. So our null is whatever it is the proportions fit the distribution that we've stated. And the nulls will always look like this. The proportions match. And the alternative is they don't match. Now, because these are they're equal signs, it looks like this is going to be a two-tailed test, but I'll tell you ahead of time, goodness of fit tests are always upper tail tests. Okay. So what are we going to do? How are we going to test this? Well, let me show you the test statistic. I think that's probably the next thing to show you. Um, if we so if we define the test statistic, it's going to look like this. It's going to give us we're going to collect some data, and then we're going to use that to calculate this. Chi squared equals the sum from i equals one to k of the observed frequency minus the expected frequency squared f sub i minus e sub i squared over the expected frequency. 
that's going to be distributed chi squared with k minus 1 degrees of freedom. Now, what is this stuff? Well, k is going to be the number of categories, which in this case is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. fi is the observed frequency for category i. Frequency is just a count, right? How many people said one, you know, pre progresso, that's the observed frequency for category i. And EI is the expected frequency. Okay, now let's see. Let's imagine that we did this. We'll work, we'll work through this. Oops, a daisy. Those disappeared. That's not cool. Not sure why those disappeared. I apologize. I'll, oh, there we go. They're back. Excellent. Okay, so the, that's our test statistic. Chi squared equals this big thing. I'll write it again as we need it. Um, but we, what we need to do now is we need to actually observe the frequencies, right? This is step three for those of you who've been keeping up. This is step three where we choose the test statistic. Step four is going to be to compute it um, and to collect the data. And more and more often as we're working through this stuff, we're going to be looking more intensively at the data because it's getting a little more complicated. So what are our observed frequencies? Well, first we need to get a survey of 500 people and we'll get these results, okay? We have the, I'm numbering the categories. I'm building a table here, and we have an observed frequency. Right, 82 people chose Progresso, 105 people chose Ragu. Basically, we're sorting you know these response cards into piles, and this is the size of the pile number of cards. And so that's FI. Now, how do we calculate our expected frequency? Well, under the null, we thought that 20% of people would choose um, Progresso, Ragu, Prego, and other, and we thought that 10% of people would choose um, DiGiorno and Contadina. We asked 500 people, and so we can calculate our expected frequency like this. For each case, we take our uh, expected proportion, our hypothetical proportion, and multiply it by the sample size. So that's just uh, that's pi times n. Let's see if I can write that here. Ei equals pi times n, and that's how we get our expected frequencies. That's what each of these are right here. Right? That's what that is. Okay, now, if you look at our test statistic again, what we need to do next to continue calculating it is we need to take the difference. It's the sum for over i of fi minus ei squared over ei. So what we do is we take our observed frequencies. We subtract our expected frequencies. You can do this in Excel. That's where I did this, right? So this is 100, or this is 82 minus 100, 105 minus 100, 87 minus 100, 65 minus 50. Then we square it. So this would be 25, right? This would be 18 squared, whatever that is. This would be 4. This would be 81. And we divide it by EI. So if you do that, this is what it looks like. In each of these cases, you have whatever this stuff right here. You crunch it through. For each category, then, you have what you'd think of as kind of like a weighted deviation from expectation, right? So F, you know, the, the frequency differs from our expectation. How much? Well, we square it to keep them all positive, and then we divide by the expectation because, you know, when you have low expectations, it's going to... Well, in any case, that's what we do. Um, and in order to get our test statistic, the sum of i means we just add up this value for each of these. It's very important to notice that the sum is in front of the whole fraction and not just above or below. So we're not adding up the EIs, we're not adding up these. We take this whole right side, this whole fraction, for each, each category and we add those together. And that's how we get what we get. Okay, so what we do then is we take 3.24, add it all up. When you do all that, you'll get this. Chi squared, oh, oops a daisy, let me uh, make it so you can see what I'm doing. Chi squared equals 10.57. And under the null, this is distributed chi squared with n minus, or k minus one, remember k is six, because we have six categories, so this is chi squared with five degrees of freedom. Okay. Now, we're always going to reject the null if the difference between the observed frequencies and the expected frequencies are large, right? We're testing to see how far away from our, expect, our expected frequencies are. 
So that's why it's an upper tail test, right? We're looking to see if there's a big difference. We're squaring this, so it's always going to be positive, and it's going to be if, if it's too big, then we uh, then we pull it away. Now, what we want to do then is we want to look at our chi squared table. I think I have mine up. Yep, and we're looking at five degrees of freedom, and you can see here. Uh, something that looks like this. So you go across and you can see 9.236 and 11.070, um, which if you're doing it right means you should, ours falls smack in between there, right? So that's a, just a smaller version that I happen to put together beforehand and now you have it. So chi squared falls, our, our test statistic falls between these two values, which means that our area in the upper tail is going to fall between these two values, between 0, 0.5 and 0, 0.10. So, what do we do? Well, we can write that 0 0.05 is less than our p-value, is less than 0 0.10. What does this mean? Well, if alpha was 0 0.05, I'm not sure I picked an alpha, and I, probably, I should definitely have done that, but if alpha is over here, then we would fail to reject the null. So despite the fact that, you know, that we our data doesn't exactly match um, our our hypothetical proportions, it's not so far away that we can reject that that, that the, this hypothetical proportion represents the, the true population values of those. Okay, so we have a test statistic. It looks at the squared differences between observed frequencies and expected frequencies, and it uses that difference to infer how well a hypothetical distribution fits our data. Um, so the stuff to take away from this, what do we need to take away? Uh, well, there's a few things. Nothing so, so different. Our hypotheses always look like this. The proportions match our, hypo our hypothetical, right? Usually the question will give you a bunch of proportions. And then we're testing that against the uh, alternative that the proportions don't match. That's all, all, yeah. Yep, that's good. There we go. The population proportion match. Um, that's step one. Step two choosing alphas just like we've done before. Step three, our test statistic is chi squared equals the sum from i equals one to k, where i is categories, not individuals, of f, the observed frequency for category i minus the expected frequency for category i squared, all over the expected frequency for category i. Under the null, this has a chi squared distribution with k minus one degrees of freedom. Once you, you need to put together a table usually to find this. You can use Excel. It makes it go a lot faster. Um, and then you get a value for chi-squared. That's all step four. Um, and then, just like before, you use your chi-squared table uh, to draw an inference, right? If p is less than alpha, reject. Otherwise, you can't. So some of this stuff is new, some of it's stuff you've seen before, but now certainly should be prepared to do these kind of problems. Um, if I get a chance, I'll do a problem today. If not, I'll be doing one in the short, in the near future, and so you'll get a chance to see those soon enough. Thanks, guys. If you have any questions, shoot me an email at jjdelaney at ualr.edu um, or post a comment, and I'll do what I can to help. See you soon. Bye.